Hey, this is Ed Mills with the Colorado Broadband Office. I uh, hope you're having a, a great day on this uh, fine Tuesday. Thanks for joining us for Lunch and Learn series. Uh, today we uh, have a, a, a session that uh, we've had before with Project Thor, uh, but uh, we thought it'd be important to give you an update. Just a few uh, housekeeping uh, things. We, uh, uh, we're gonna have Nate give us the presentation and then we'll have some time for uh, question and answers. If at any point you don't wanna ask a question, but you'd like to have something answered, go ahead and put it in the chat section and we'll take care of that. Normally I like to start, start these meetings off at uh, our great resource, which is our website. Uh, but right now uh, it's having a little bit of an issue. And so Megan is trying to figure out what's going on there. Uh, but anyway, let me just go ahead and get started by introducing uh, our speaker as well as uh, the subject today. Uh, today we have uh, Nate Wallowitz from the Northwest Council of Governments. And uh, he is gonna be talking about Project Thor uh, stakeholders and how they've created a robust, redundant and affordable middle mile fiber network across Northwest Colorado. And the goal was achieved through robust government and industry collaboration, public private partnerships and a creative commitment, uh, committed leadership to drive the project to completion. Uh, also today, we're gonna talk about how the Northwest COG, DOLA and DORA and other regional government plans to deploy additional middle mile network services to help broadband reach all Coloradans. For those of you who don't know, and you saw the report that came out from the Colorado Broadband Office that was presented by the governor, uh, Nate served on my committee, which was the Future Technologies Committee. And we have a, a great belief that um, we have to have a robust fiber infrastructure throughout Colorado. Nate is a good friend of mine. Uh, I've known him for a long time. Uh, not only do I get to intersect with him and uh, the work that uh, we do here at the state, but also he serves uh, on the fire department uh, where I serve. And Nate, I am not gonna take any more of your time. And so uh, would you go ahead and uh, share with us about Project Thor and what's been going on? Thanks, Ed, good afternoon. And good afternoon, everyone. There are a lot of familiar names out there. I can only see some of them, but thank you very much for coming. Uh, I know that you've, uh, many of you have been involved um, before and saw the original Project Thor presentation. And if you followed along with, with Ed and the Colorado, uh, the Colorado Broadband Office, um, you know how integrally um, uh, Northwest COG has worked with CBO, um, the um, region economic development region 10 as well. Virgil Turner is, is my partner. Um, and uh, just a, a quick commercial, this project, my project and my position are 50% funded by the department, the Colorado Department of Local Affairs. Um, without their support, projects like Project Thor and many community broadband projects um, wouldn't happen without, um, without their uh, support. Um, and their funding resources to be able to allow local communities um, to build the infrastructure that they need um, to move forward um, with these broadband projects. Um, Ed asked me to specifically not go over a lot of the initial details that we shared. Um, so I'll just share kind of an update with you. And um, because Project Thor is an in integral part of our Northwest, our Northwest COG um, broadband program, um, as well as the statewide broadband program, I thought I'd share both with you as well. Um, so here we go. Uh, a general overview of, of the type of support that I provide um, through DOLA um, um, for communities across Colorado. Um, we support local broadband projects. Whether that uh, whether that's um, connecting community anchor institutions, questions um, from communities about how do I connect my school, how do I connect my um, my fire departments, public works, how do I how do I help coordinate um, fiber connections to help me um, interconnect um, our um, our medical um, community together, and then of course. 
probably most importantly today um, and applicable today is how do students in my community and families in my community get access to um, improved broadband resources because now people are working from home, kids are studying from home, hopefully we'll migrate back to that. But I think now that just my view of the world and what I'm seeing is um, that this online community that was, that was created in the schools, even as we get back to full-time learning, um, there's still going to be all those online resources that are going to be available to students and we want to make sure that they have the accessibility they need um, to as, as these programs migrate and as education migrates. Um, so um, Northwest Cog Project Thor platform uh, is, uh, we have a platform at CoreSight in Denver. Uh, so we are connected out to the world in, world in Denver. And we also interconnect um, as a key location in Denver to get access to the internet and also um, uh, uh, it's the central point for our fiber loops. I'll show you a map in a few moments. Um, in the future, we're, we're looking at some new projects. Uh, Town of Hudson currently is uh, in, the, in the beginning stages of um, creating a fiber to the premise fiber loop that the town will own. They have, a, uh, they have an ISP partner uh, and they're looking for more partners. Um, to be able to deliver broadband um, to their entire community. Uh, I'm working with the town alignment out on the Eastern Plains. They're also interested in looking at, um, at creating a uh, fiber to the prem fiber loop um, and uh, then also getting a, a, a reliable connection back to Denver. Um, in Lyman, one of the keys is um, they have healthcare providers um, and I've been working with Stephanie Bennett uh, in, in the um, Office of Healthcare Innovation because they're the connection uh, at the state level to a lot of these community healthcare providers. And so we're going to try to figure out how we bridge funding between local, local community funding, broadband, um, DOLA funding potentially, and then telehealth and telemedicine funding that could be available from the state and the federal government to help support um, interconnection of healthcare and all the other community resources. Um, working with the looking at looking working with the town of Woodland Park, also working with the Jefferson uh, County Mountain Area um, School Articulation Area to try to figure out how we can leverage better broadband in their community. Um, uh, Colorado Department of Energy provided um, uh, Jefferson County Public Schools last year with a grant um, to fiber connect their schools uh, down on the down on the front range in the in the plains. But the mountain area schools weren't a part of that, and now they want to bring their mountain area schools together with a fiber project. So, working working with them as well to try to figure out how we can bring a lot of resources together. Um, uh, interconnection with Region 10 um, uh, at Glenwood Springs is a is a critical piece. Region 10 um, is is another uh, uh, publicly owned fiber project, um, and they cover Mesa and Delta. Um, I'm sorry, Montrose and Delta counties, uh, and um, so they have fiber infrastructure that helps support those communities. We're looking at future projects in Region 10 um, to connect into Durango and the Southwest COG projects. And we'll kind of talk about those if there are questions um, later on. Um, we, uh, we have a, um, a connection right now that's uh, currently hot um, between Estes Park and Granby. Um, and this is an emergency communications connection uh, we brought this connection up during the Cameron Peak and uh, East Troublesome fires uh, back in October uh, because all the, the, the existing fiber connections um, to both communities were certainly in danger of, of being burned over by the fire. And uh, so to support broadband, um, critical communications infrastructure, 
from cell sites to town and county operations to 911 and reverse 911 services um, all came through this, um, this connection. We are working to uh, make this a permanent feature and you'll see that in, in some of the maps that I show later. And Nate, um, let me uh, stop you yeah, there. Go ahead. A lot of people uh, uh, may not know this. And so, <clears throat> and Nate being the humble guy that he is, as I said, he's a good friend. So I have a lot of uh, contact with Nate. Uh, but for his work, uh, Nate, this actually, the Estes Park, the Grand View Emergency Connection Project, that happened, I mean, basically, you uh, got the, the support and the team together within a weekend. Isn't, isn't that about the timeline? Yes, that's, that's the timeline. We were able to pull all the pieces together and, and, and stand up all those pieces and get the interconnections going in, in, in a weekend. And so for those of you uh, maybe are outside of the state of Colorado or maybe just moved uh, new to the area, uh, our state was just absolutely ravaged by um, wildland fires this past year, even in our own community, the community that Nate and I live in, uh, we had a fire uh, blow up, but because of uh, Nate's work uh, with the Northwest COG and uh, his team, all, all the work that they did in this basically weekend, uh, Nate just recently received the Tom Clements Better Government Award for creating an emergency fiber link between Granby and Estes Park during the Cameron Peak fire. So, uh, Nate, uh, hats off to you and uh, just wanted to throw that in there. Thanks, Ed. Otherwise, I would have been on an engine actually fighting the fire. Exactly. So, <laughs> so there we go. Um, I I urge all of you to take a look at um, at UCAR and the Bison Network. Um, the Bison Network has a very technical name. Uh, it was actually featured by the Colorado Broadband Office last month. Um, Project Thor and the Region 10 connections are integral to trying to bring um, all of our um, higher educational institutions together um, on the Bison Network. So we're trying to extend the Bison Network from the front range um, all the way out to, uh, to include um, all our communities across all of Colorado. Um, and um, the Bison Network not, not only supports these higher, educate, higher ed communities, um, but it also supports access to internet too and other educational resources for our K-12 students. So it's, it's a really critical piece. This is where that intersection happens between um, economic development, education and public safety when we look when we ask the question so what's this really doing why am i really building a broadband project um, across across the state and why should state government be involved in this and how come my rural electric co-op wants to put fiber up on their poles to um, to uh, to improve broadband it's it's about creating community and it's about bringing these resources together for multiple pieces of our community. It's not just, it's not just so, um, so people can stream Netflix um, yeah, in our communities and entertainment. It's about economic development and all those other pieces um, that help create community um, across, across a, uh, a town, a community, a region, a county, and statewide. Nate, so, let, me, let me also say uh, on that, because you did reference, uh, we did have Bison uh, last month. You can always find the Lunch and Learn series on our website. And uh, we uh, do that video on demand. We put any of the slide presentations. For example, today's presentation in its entirety with Nate will be up on our website in about three or four days and uh, his slide presentation and any other documents that he wants to make available to you. So always know that that's a resource. The Lunch and Learns go back a couple of years, uh, maybe two or three years, and uh, you can find all of our past presentations on our website. Thanks, Nate. Thanks, Ed. Uh, here's, a, here's a map of, Project Thor, of the Project Thor network. Uh, as you can see, it's, 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 a regional, it's a regional fiber network we created this network based on um, our users and our communities um, 
talking about their local broadband networks and what they wanted to do to expand broadband in their community, but they didn't have access to affordable, reliable broadband. Um, in many areas in Colorado, a single fiber cut can take out um, can take out entire communities or an entire region of the state. Um, and this was being experienced with our communities. So uh, we, we, figured, we figured out between lease circuits and lighting existing fiber, um, how we could build um, multiple resilient loops um, across our region um, so, that we can, so that we could make sure that uh, we had resilient service. Um, any single cut or any single connection in our network that gets cut, um, we have resiliency and the network actually will dynamically reroute so that, uh, so that there is minimal interruption um, to um, internet traffic um, across our region. Uh, we have, we have not, not only do we have um, communities on our network, we have schools, we have hospitals, um, we, have, um, we have consumers on our network, we have smaller ISPs on our network that uh, rely on our network um, for their broadband connections back to, back to, uh, back to Denver and the world. Um, but we also have, we also have, um, um, we have the public safety infrastructure um, that's also leveraging our network. Um, we have an, any number of dispatch centers, public safety, um, law enforcement, fire, EMS, um, and, uh, and mountain rescue agencies are also um, either customers of uh, Project Thor stakeholders directly or um, or their customers of ISPs who provide services on our network. Um, this network wouldn't have been possible um, unless we had had local stakeholders and local folks um, from communities that stepped up and said, yes, we are willing to put our capital in, our capital resource money in um, to be able to build Project Thor as a match, a 50-50 match to the DOLA grant program. So communities like um, Rio Blanco County, uh, City of Steamboat Springs, Route County, um, Steamboat Springs Schools, um, Town of Eagle, Town of uh, City of Glenwood Springs, City of Aspen, um, uh, Breckenridge, Summit County, uh, Georgetown, um, I, uh, Clear Creek County um, and um, a couple of other private partners um, all invested their capital because they saw this as a value, not only to their community, but to the region as a whole. And I'll talk about some of our progress um, and some of where we've gone um, here uh, in tangible ways in just a moment. Here, this is actually the Project Thor architecture for you, uh, for folks who are more technically oriented. Um, and as you can see, it's a dynamic loop. Um, we, we are connected back and forth um, within our communities. You can, see the, you can see all the loops that we've created for resiliency, um, which is especially important in communities like, um, as you're looking at projects, um, Breckenridge, Aspen, and um, communities in Grand County, where um, as you get to the edge of any network, um, if you're if you're in a river valley, or if you're um, or if you're going up um, into an area where where there is no back door, we've created we've created uh, logical and physical um, resilient connections to reach these communities so that, so that a single uh, fiber cut or single circuit cut doesn't cut them off um, from the rest of the world. Um, and again, I, we couldn't have done this without the cooperation of our partners. Um, so in 2021, some of the things we're looking at with Project Thor, uh, Pitkin County is partnering with, uh, with Holy Cross Energy 
um, to build the Roaring Fork broadband network. Um, this network will not will will give multiple communities across the Roaring Fork Valley uh, to have access to um, resilient broadband connectivity. This isn't just uh, to help support um, additional bandwidth needs within the city of Aspen. Um, we're going to be adding the communities of Basalt and Snowmass Village. Um, there are opportunities and the network is designed so as more communities and areas of interest um, uh, step forward, we can, we can very conveniently and cost effectively um, add them to that Picking County Roaring Fork broadband network. It's an extraordinary opportunity and it also connects the, um, the Picking County um, uh, wireless broadband um, tower network that um, they've been building out um, since, um, since about uh, 2015, 2016. Um, we very much support the town of Eagle and some of their um, local broadband initiatives. Um, the town of Brackenridge Fiber 9600 project um, is partly fed by Project Thor. So that's an extraordinary partnership. And those are just some of, and these are just some of the partners um, that we work with. Um, and some of the loan and grant support that uh, uh, Project Thor, Northwest Cog, and some of our partners um, have, have uh, leveraged um, to be able to deploy uh, more robust broadband throughout our region. Um, we talked about partnerships in the Cameron Peak Fire. Um, we, this was actually um, one of our partners was out during the East Troublesome Fire um, the, and they were um, wrapping up some uh, fiber splicing um, for us at that time. You can see, you can see how there was so much, um, how how critical this was, given that the fire is two and a half miles away at the, from this picture, um, and yet there are crews out there working to ensure that this connection stayed up between um, Estes Park uh, and Granby. So. Just an extraordinary effort. I can't say I can't say more um, in complimentary terms that uh, than the dedication of everyone uh, on the team to make this happen. It was it was just extraordinary. Um, so the network at this point, we continue to maintain operations reliably, despite the fact that we continue from time to time to experience um, fiber cuts, fiber outages. Costs are currently contained, and uh, they're well within they're well within the parameters that we were forecast. If you, uh, when I when I look back, uh, we started on the concept and the business plan for the network, uh, and all our cost models were created in 2017, and here we are in 2020, and we're we're just about a year. Um, from the formal complete launch of the network and the, the cost projections from 2017 held. So um, extraordinary credit to, uh, to all of our partners um, who work together. Um, uh, when we talk about broadband affordability, um, IP bandwidth, which you might, call, you might call it DIA if you're in the industry, direct internet access costs, um, this is, these are the actual bits that go across the network. Project Thor is a transport network. We get the bits from point A to point B, um, and then people have the opportunity um, to purchase um, IP bandwidth and DIA um, from our platform in Denver. Um, we have a, right now on the network, we started out at a cost of 50 cents a meg this time last, uh, this time last year. Uh, we're now down to 36 cents a meg. Before Project Thor was built, uh, the lowest cost, the, the lowest price um, per meg for bandwidth that uh, anybody in the region was paying was about $1.10 per meg. So significantly reducing the cost um, of IP bandwidth, which as far as, as far as I look at a business model, uh, if I'm in the business community and I'm an ISP, I, uh, especially a smaller ISP, I look at that and I say, well, okay, 
well, that just means I have more money in my budget to help either build uh, to help either build out um, to more communities or provide better support for my customers. Um, so it gives them uh, the ability to create uh, a more profitable business. And especially in communities where we know that one of the challenges is when you have low density of, of subscribers within a community, it makes it hard to make the business case work. We're trying to help, we're trying to help them um, make the business case work. And we're looking forward to uh, adding Region 10 um, in the fourth quarter of this year um, to our network and interconnecting with Region 10 via I new I-70 fiber that CDOT has partnered to construct um, up from Glenwood Springs out to Grand Junction. And as you can see, we're created an IP bandwidth, if you will, a Costco buyers club model. Um, the more we buy, the lower the price goes. So um, we hope to drive down costs and, and help to continue to maintain costs. Some of the things we're looking at, hey, go Nate, ahead, Ed. Before you go to the future, um, uh, can uh, Mark uh, uh, has uh, put a question up for you and can you provide sure. a little more inf info on what is going on in the town of Woodland Park? Uh, yeah, we're just starting to talk to them. Um, they are interested in trying to figure out um, where they can go. They're, they they have the opportunity to access some fiber um, and they're looking at, they want to look at best options, best practices for how they connect their community anchor institutions and how they potentially move forward um, um, a lot of these communities, uh, I'll be, I'll be honest, um, the first, the first out of the first two sentences that I get when a community, um, uh, asks me if I can, if we at DOLA can help support them is number one, um, I want to, I want to improve broadband in my community, but number two, no, I'm not interested in being an ISP. I don't have the technical resources. I'm, I, I'd much rather support private companies coming in um, and doing it, or this just really isn't within um, my wheelhouse to even try to bite off. So there are any number of communities that are now starting to get engaged as we get more of these um, uh, fiber projects uh, moving forward across the state and local broadband projects they see the models and they see it, um, they see it starting to work in their local communities. Um, certainly um, uh, a number of rural electric cooperatives are also um, looking at um, building out fiber. Number one, it helps their business case. Um, number two, it, it gives them an opportunity to provide um, additional, um, additional um, value um, and additional economic development and education opportunities uh, to their share owners. Because uh, for those of you that don't know, a rural electric co-op is, because it's a co-op, it's actually owned by their rate payers. Every single one of their rate payers is a member. Um, so the more that they can do for their membership truly creates much better value um, for that community resource. Um, Ed, did you have any other questions while we're at a pause? Yeah, so uh, I didn't. Uh, Mark, uh, did you, is that uh, good information there? Does that work for you, Mark? Yeah, no, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, uh, and, and a lot of these conversations, uh, I'll, I'll say that a lot of these conversations start and It takes a while for local communities to really put that broadband plan together and for them to help figure out exactly um, exactly what they want to do and put a plan together that's compatible for their community. Um, what what Bill Schrum um, has been leading in terms of broadband efforts in the town of Eagle or um, 
or uh, Shannon Haynes in uh, town of Breckenridge uh, with their fiber 9600 project. Those are those while they're both looking at how they promote broadband in their community, their development plans can be very different because each community is very different and um, their um, their interest in being a servant, whether they want to be a service provider or not, whether they are local ISPs that have come to them, does it make sense to, uh, for them to help build fiber in their community? Does it make sense uh, to bring community partners together and find funding through other avenues? Um, that local solution for broadband in a community, um, while there, while we can all see models uh, and examples, even even if it's it's never cookie cutter. People, I never hear people say, "Yeah, just give me somebody else's broadband plan." What they want is to look at somebody else's broadband plan and then make it their own, because each community is unique, and that's in, and that's an important piece to remember. Uh, when you look at any of these projects, whether it's Project Thor, whether it's Region 10, or whether it's local community broadband, it's it's all different. And and by the way, front range communities are 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 still very interested and still very engaged in figuring out, okay, how can I improve broadband in my community? Because despite the um, even having existing providers. There are a number of communities that also want to look at additional options and how can they bring additional options um, that um, that are uh, are more cost effective or um, are more reliable or and meet any of the other factors that uh, a community may have for broadband. Um, so it is it it becomes uh, it becomes relevant in almost every community, no matter where you are. Um, just right now, the focus on is on rural broadband because broadband is is so is 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 such a challenge um, in our rural communities. Nate, we have uh, some other questions. Sure. And, um, I was looking in the list because Bob Pfeiffer was on with us. Bob, are you still with us? Looks like he's had to drop off. But uh, the question is, uh, I'm wondering if you have any updates on I-70 fiber path construction. And then we'll break this into two parts. Uh, there's another one that talks about Arcadian. Sure. Yeah. Um, what I what what I know about I-70 um, fiber path construction is that um, it it is in progress right now from Glenwood Springs to Grand Junction. Um, CDOT is is working to um, to facilitate that build within their right of way. And that construction is ongoing. Uh, the latest, the latest completion date that I have on that currently is uh, Q4 of this year. Um, it should be that work should be completed, um, and um, the and the availability of 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 uh, of CDOT fiber is there. Bob Pfeiffer is. I can't say enough good things about Bob. Um, his partnership um, and the CDOT of the and the support of the CDOT team uh, has been has been extraordinary, uh, and it not only benefits Northwest Cog and Project Thor. It's going to benefit Region Ten. Um, it and it benefits communities um, up and down the I twenty five corridor as well. Um, one of the reasons that um, that town of Hudson will be able to um, access affordable broadband um, is because um, they'll be able to leverage that CDOT fiber along uh, uh, I-76 to ride to ride the light, if you will, to borrow the old marketing term from Quest. Um, they, they will light that up and, um, with town purchased equipment, and then they'll come into Denver um, so that they, they can um, procure um, more affordable broadband. Ed, does that answer your question? Uh, is that or, or the question? Does that work? Well, 
we're getting the thumbs up. So I think we're good. Oh, good. So, second hey, one thumbs up more. is good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and and CDOT's a great partner. Uh, I can't I can't say enough good things about them. And uh, there's there's such an opportunity if you can take advantage of that resource coupled with other resources, you can build a great robust solution um, with with the existing infrastructure um, that we've put in place. And um, Ed mentioned Arcadian and. Let, let me go um, ahead and set that. Ed, one yeah, there. why don't you talk about Arcadian? Because I did mention it back in, 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 yeah. in one of the slides. Um, I'll go back to it. So, for those uh, of you who don't know, the uh, the Arcadian uh, this started about three and a half years ago. Uh, it was actually myself, uh, my boss uh, at the time, Tony Neal Graves, and uh, Bob Pfeiffer, that uh, we went down to um, the the tribes, the Ute Mountain Ute Indian tribe, as well as Southern Ute tribe. And uh, we also uh, took uh, Arcadian, we met them down there. Uh, back then it was just a thought or an idea. We weren't really sure whether or not it would come to fruition. Uh, their ask was to uh, bring a fiber run through the Southern Ute Indian tribe up Highway uh, 550, and then uh, to traverse across 160 up over Wolf Creek Pass, and then eventually to get to 285, and then 285 back in the day, I forget where they wanted to go, but uh, I think we've con convinced them to come into Denver uh, on 6th. Um, it took a long time for us to uh, get that, uh, to, uh, to, to make it actually become uh, a reality, it looks like. Uh, again, Bob Pfeiffer was very instrumental in that and striking agreements and making sure that everything is in place. Uh, I will also say that we've taken the same template and I've connected Bob with um, uh, New Mexico um, Department of Transportation and they're what's equivalent to the OIT CBO office. And uh, we're actually building templates for uh, other folks that wanna run fiber runs uh, up there. So the Arcadian uh, project is still moving forward. Uh, had a meeting with them, I think it was either this week or last week, probably last week, and uh, still uh, working on some of the funding for that project, but it looks like uh, that is progressing, uh, maybe not as quickly as we would like uh, it to, but it is uh, progressing. I'll say one other thing before I let Nate take a shot at this one, is that um, at one point, uh, it was kind of like the Arcadian thing's on, maybe it, it might not happen, it's on, maybe it might not happen. Uh, when it started to look like there was uh, some, you know, some real movement behind it, um, the best guy I could think of was Nate Wallowitz. And rather than, we just didn't have enough time to go and talk to all the communities along 550, 160, uh, uh, 285, all the way into Denver, whatever route, Sixth Avenue or whatever. And so Nate and I got on the phone and we basically, we negotiated with Arcadian. We said, would you give us access points to fiber all along that path? And Arcadian was, um, they were very open to that. And they said, uh, we will uh, do that. We didn't know what the future would hold, but we did know uh, that um, we would need uh, fiber to connect all of our rural communities. So anyway, with that uh, kind of uh, build up there, Nate, um, do you have any updates on Arcadian, uh, or am I the last one to touch that? Uh, you're the Ed. You're the last one to touch that. Um, and um, I guess at this point, I, I should talk because we're talking statewide. Um, uh, Ed, can you see the uh, can you see the uh, the presentation with with all the maps? Okay. Um, uh, we uh, Virgil Turner and I put together a presentation for the Department of Local Affairs, and uh, and uh, this is certainly this was shared with CBO, and we're we're all trying to work towards this model. Um, there are a lot of lines here, but basically the uh, the Arcadian connection. If you look at the dotted yellow line that goes up into Durango, and then comes up and across and comes up back into Denver. This is this is part of the this is part of the Arcadian run that can and part of the vision is connect Arcadian and connect region 10 into 
the Southwest COG projects that were started in 2009, 2010, funded by DOLA funds, which were local fiber loops um, within, within those communities. We have the Region 10 project here in purple. Um, uh, Northwest COG's uh, Project Thor is in, is in blue. Uh, the Roaring Fork Valley project and the Pitkin County uh, Roaring Fork Valley project is here in green. Um, and the uh, orange is the bison network. And when you look at the red lines, that's where CDOT currently has fiber today. Um, so there's, there's fiber infrastructure there today that we can let that we can all leverage together and you can help us leverage together. Um, that's part of, that's part of this. That's part of the model of let's bring all our resources together, figure out what pieces we have, um, and then we can help connect um, and, and bring more projects together. Some of these green dots are, uh, these green dots are individually funded local broadband projects that DOLA funded. As you can see, they're currently not connected, but as we start to bring some of these future um, connections together, we can start to bring them together um, and start to leverage the values of a, a community investment um, with uh, that is already existing with future programs and future partnerships to be able to provide more value and more connectivity um, to these communities. Um, uh, as we, and Ed, Ed uh, in, 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 uh, in my promo, I said that I would talk about um, the, um, the DORA projects as well and the DORA funding. Here in, as, as an example, here in Steamboat Springs, our, our partner Yampa Valley Electric um, has leveraged um, uh, USDA funds, uh, RDOF funding, and also the DORA Colorado Broadband um, Fund to, uh, to build out their network within uh, Route County. Um, they, they, are, they also serve uh, Moffitt County. And so this whole region where Yampa Valley Electric serves, um, they're going to build out broadband um, where today um, there are an awful lot of places that, that um, are, are partnered with some of their wireless ISPs. And, um, and by the way, they do also partner with local wireless ISPs to provide services. So this is really an extraordinary way where, where you look at Project Thor provides affordable bandwidth. Yampa Valley Electric and, their, and other wireless ISPs connect to that infrastructure. And then they're able to affordably build out um, to existing areas within, um, within their service territories um, to provide broadband. And they leverage um, the DOLA investment with DORA funds and also federal funding. To, to make this all possible. So it's not just a one size fits all solution. Um, we're currently working in Grand County um, to also try to deliver um, um, a bit of a, a more unique solution there. Um, there are some folks who are trying to put a, um, a provider model um, together to, uh, to make that happen. Um, I'm gonna go back and share my screen. Um, so for, 2021 with Project Thor, um, we're looking to whether we're looking at um, our value proposition and whether we look to light more least dark fiber um, uh, as opposed to um, le uh, recurring cost circuits. Um, we're looking at new partnerships uh, across the region, and uh, we're also looking at um, the ability to provide additional services. We're um, we we are our whole pro project Thor infrastructure is based on Sienna hardware um, and software. The Sienna infrastructure allows us to do an awful lot more than just provide point to point or um, fiber loop connectivity. We can we can potentially 
um, drive more services that meet more individual needs in communities um, and um, to support additional providers um, within the region. So uh, we're kind of looking at we're kind of looking at that. And since we're coming up on uh, 12:45, um, I'm going to I'm going to leave it there and um, really um, go to the question slide. And I look forward to your questions. And um, and certainly there's my contact information um, if you want to reach out and, and uh, talk talk directly. Let me uh, just uh, get it started here. And uh, uh, you do not have to put your questions in the chat. Feel free to just unmute yourself uh, when it's appropriate and you can ask Nate the question. But Nate, we still have, uh, uh, it looks like five questions. Uh, and so this may be a little complicated. I'll give you all the questions. You can see it in the chat if you need to read over it again. But uh, the first uh, one is who owns the fiber? Second, who owns the dark fiber? Third, who repairs the network? And then, uh, so it's four, five years from now, who's going to repair the network? Because as we know, fiber does have maybe, uh, history tells us, maybe 40 to 50 years. Uh, we can uh, get rid of some of the issues with technology because as it becomes brittle and, and maybe has some issues with the glass, uh, technology can help that. But uh, who owns a fiber? Who owns dark fiber? Who repairs the network five years from now? Uh, who's going to take care of those repairs on the network? And Ed, I can't see the chat just in the way that uh, that my window set up. So thanks for uh, thanks for reading those questions. Um, who owns who owns the fiber? Um, it it depends. Um, we leverage some commercial dark fiber. CDOT owns some of the fiber. Um, Northwest Cog and our local government partners own some of the fiber. Um, especially the 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 um, the connections from um, from major infrastructure points like from I seventy to our local um, each of our stakeholders um, we call them meet me centers um, we have smaller uh, scale um, smaller bandwidth um, access points on the network that we call meet points um, some folks in if you've been around long enough, some communities call them CNLs, carrier neutral locations. Um, so um, a variety of folks um, own the fiber. Um, I think the next question was who repairs the fiber? We contract with commercial organizations um, to do our fiber construction and do any, and do any fiber repairs unless that fi unless that fiber repair is is the responsibility of of the fiber owner um, and in which case we identify we are we identify where the fiber challenges are and work with them to get that repaired um, who's going to maintain the fiber in five years same answer if if it's local fiber if it's fiber that Northwest Cog is operating um, or owns, um, uh, we are going to we will uh, maintain that through our partners. Um, one of the one of the real challenges of putting uh, Project Thor together as a program is, all right, how do we find all of this expertise? Because um, um, that's one of the challenges when you look at a local community and you. When you look at a local community and um, hang on, let me mute my phone. I'm sorry. Um, uh, how do I do this? Where do I start? I don't have this expertise. Um, well, in Colorado, we are very fortunate um, to have a lot of great companies who are willing to partner with local governments, regional governments, um, the state. We have commercial partners who are extraordinarily motivated and interested in helping um, local communities and help bring those partnerships together. Um, um, I, I will say that, um, you know, public private partnerships are, are uh, represent an extraordinary opportunity um, 
to bring the resources together that we need um, and to um, help support the community. And um, certainly in, in a couple of the slides, you've seen some of the names of, of the, um, the private partners or the public, quasi-public um, partners um, that we have that, that uh, make delivery of Project Thor in communities possible. Ed, does that cover it? Does that cover those five questions? It, you did, you got, got them perfectly. Does anybody else have any uh, questions for Nate? We've got a uh, little under uh, 10 minutes and uh, this is now your chance to, to get some, uh, some good information. Always love that dead silence. Yeah, I always you love did that. did a great job. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess so. Um, and and I will say that um, one of our one of our partners at Northwest College oh, one again. that that helped make um, that helped make Project Thor possible um, is our partnership with uh, with Mammoth Networks, um, Evan Biaggi and and the entire team at Mammoth Networks. The, the two Bryans um, and and the and all their employees have really helped us pull all the pieces together that we needed to at a time when we didn't have the when we didn't have the information or we weren't sure where to go um, they they helped us they are our network operator which kind of goes back to your question about the fiber um, uh, we um, at Northwest Cog, Northwest Cog's broadband program. You're looking at them. Uh, so we chose to partner and go out to industry partners who could provide us with the services that we need um, to um, to create our carrier class broadband transport network um, across our region. And did I hear that we had a question? Yeah. Actually, I guess it's more for the Colorado Broadband Office. Um, with the increased, first, has the additional $50 million been approved by the state budget office? And then secondly, when do you feel um, the award process would take place for the winter um, DORA applications? Or DOLA, I can't remember which one, sorry. So that's uh, completely outside of my realm. As far as I know, um, I don't have any update on the 50 million. And uh, I don't know if you can speak to the other question, Nate. Um, do you have any intel on that? Um, I know that the um, I know that the DORA, um, the DORA grant period um, ex, um, uh, uh, for applications expired. Uh, in I think it was January fifteenth, so they'd be in their next their their two year their their um, six month cycles. The Department of Local Affairs um, cycles are are quarterly, um, but um, they are they are evaluating applications on a rolling basis. So if a community submits say submits an application. And by the way, the, my, my, the, the person that I work with, at, the people that I work with at DOLA are the DOLA regional managers. Um, the head of the DOLA broadband program um, at DOLA is Greg Winkler. Um, and Greg right now is on a schedule where if you submit a grant application, um, probably 45 to 60 days, um, that application will be evaluated and, um, and they will have the, uh, they will have whatever meetings and hearings, uh, they have to have based on the, uh, based on the funding, um, level. DOLA has a funding limit per project of $1 million. DOLA has five and a half million dollars, um, allocated every year, um, for, um, for um, uh, broadband projects funded by the Department of Local Affairs. Does that help? And I will, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, well, uh, if 
somebody has a question, go ahead and get that ready. Uh, I will kind of do the shameless plug that I normally do at the end of these sessions. Uh, Colorado Broadband Office and uh, the website that we have, we try to make it a repository for all things that are broadband. So you can check in there frequently to see this uh, video on demand, as well as it will answer questions about federal grants, state grants, and anything that we can um, share with you and add value to you um, from a Colorado perspective that relates to broadband. So I would check it frequently. If you haven't signed up for our newsletter, uh, that is another way to get informative information. We don't uh, want to inundate your uh, inbox, uh, but we do send out, uh, we've been doing it quarterly. Uh, there's been such uh, an increased demand and in information uh, that we're looking at getting on a cadence of every month, but that would be a really good, um, that would be a really good place for you to start. And we have uh, Carl Stevens said, uh, thank you for uh, the update uh, that you've given to us today, uh, Nate. Anybody else have any questions as we uh, kind of come to a close uh, for this Lunch and Learn featuring Thor? We also have a thank you, good presentation. Yep, thank you everybody. Thanks for, thanks for uh, watching and again, my contact information is up on the screen. Feel free to reach out to myself or Ed Mills or anybody else at the Colorado Broadband Office if you have questions. Like I always say, um, you know, especially in my role, we're just here to serve you. And uh, we do uh, sometimes have the, the time to go out and find the answers that you need and connect you with the right people. Um, Nate has been one of those people. He's been an invaluable resource, even as we've looked at trying to connect the parks and wildlife. Uh, he's one of those guys I can call on that is very innovative and can help us figure out how we can pull pieces together so that we can create something from nothing. So um, anyway, if there are no other questions, we're gonna go ahead and end uh, today's presentation uh, with Project Thor. Uh, we, are, uh, we have this uh, the third or fourth Tuesday of every month and uh, if you have any subjects that you would like us to address, please don't hesitate to send me an email. My email is ed.mills, M-I-L-L-S, at state.co.us. And we would love to hear what your thoughts are. And we'd like to get uh, the, the subjects that interest you in the Lunch and Learn. Thank you and uh, have, a, have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ed.